Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see all your faces. And uh, before I get started in, in my message this morning, I just want to thank everybody who partnered with Olive Crest and, and volunteered. I had a chance to go over there and see the party that they threw for the kids that were in foster care, that are in foster care. And, and uh, I don't know if you know it, but there was a, a, a Santa Claus that was there. And not only was Santa Claus there, it was Mrs. Claus. And I'm not saying anything, but I think Mrs. Claus is sitting right over there. I'm not saying for sure. But how great of a time um, that, that that was. And so I appreciate everybody who volunteered and Christine for opening that door for us. It's, just, it's a neat friendship that we have with Olive Crest and I see great things ahead in the future there. Um, not only that, but I also it failed to mention, I just want to thank um, the Footbridge Ministry just for your generosity this Christmas season to provide a, a special Christmas for, for someone who's in our own community here who otherwise wouldn't have been able to have a Christmas. And you guys all gave so generously. Um, and, and so it was a joy for me to be able to, to tell a family, hey, this is, this is what you get for Christmas this year. Here, check it out. And, and God is so faithful. And you guys are a generous congregation. So thank you very much for all that you're doing. So give yourselves a hand, you know, come on. Um, I, I love that Joe shared that song with us this morning, and, um, and I was sitting in here earlier as they were warming up and they were, they were playing their, their music, and, and I heard that, um, I just kept hearing Devil Not Now today or something, I'm like, is that, what, what is that, you know, and, and I didn't really know the rest of the song, and then hearing, hearing Joe um, share his story and, and part of what that song meant to him, and realizing that, that as he was sharing it, just I could feel all of you going, yep, yep, I, I, I understand all those lies and those things that, that hold me captive. And to know that, that through Jesus, we're not, we're not subject to that garbage. And what a song of victory that that becomes for us. And, and the only way to combat um, a lie is truth. Wouldn't you agree? You can try to combat a lie through many different ways. You can try to medicate a lie, for example, so you feel better about yourself, but still the lie remains. And the only way that you can truly be free of a lie is to be able to let truth shine upon that. And I think that if we would all share our experiences, whether we're um, those that have walked with Jesus again for a long time or searching or we're somewhere in the middle of that continuum, I think we would all say that we know what it's like to medicate when we're feeling alive. We just want to feel better. And we know what it's like when the lights turn on and truth shines into something and we're free of a bondage of fear. And this morning, um, I, I want to bring truth to you. That's what I want to bring you. I want to bring you God's word. I want to speak God's word over you. Um, I'm excited about the direction and the season that we've been in this Christmas to, to be able to sit and meditate on um, John 1 14 and, and I hope you've taken that challenge um, and if you don't there's still time if you haven't taken the challenge there's still time to, to look at John 1 14 and, and internalize it. Um, Krista this week in our staff devotions gave a, a great devotional. She was, she was just sharing her heart and, and I know all of us broke out our notepads. We're just like writing everything that she's saying and, and one of the things that she talked about was the difference between memorizing scripture and internalizing scripture that we could memorize something. How many of you were good students in the American school system and you learned how to, to eat and regurgitate? That's basically, you get, get a bunch of information in and then spill it out on paper, you know? And that's kind of, I'm sorry, that was cynical. I, I didn't mean it as bad as that sounded. But you understand what I mean, that you just learn a bunch of stuff and then you get it in there and you get it out and you get an A and you get a high five and, do, and you go on versus really internalizing, um, internalizing learning and, and how, what a privilege we have of internalizing the Word of God. And so I try to take that challenge myself. And, and so um, verse, more than just memorizing, but Lord, let it come alive in me. Let it, let it just settle in my heart. Let me think about it. Let me wake up thinking about scripture throughout the day. Let me understand it. And, um, and so, so for me, I'm going to give it a shot this morning. Okay. So John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, right? And the word was with God and the word was God. And he was with God in the beginning. And through him, all things were made. Without him, Nothing was made that has been made. He was with God in the beginning. And in him was light, life, excuse me, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There was a man sent from God, and his name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light. He himself, was, oh, excuse me, still pause right there. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. I know this. Hold on. Hold on. No, no, no. I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm not done. Okay, okay. Ready? Wait. Um, though, um, no, wait. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, 
the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, and his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who was sent from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's God's word. That's God's word. Listen, I kind of wanted to impress you, but I'm not here to impress you with, with, with memorizing scripture. I, I began trying to memorize John 1.14, and I've been reading Diedrich Bonhoeffer, and Diedrich Bonhoeffer, if you know anything about him, will smack you upside down and backwards, but in such a loving way, and, and what it means to be a disciple, and he challenges us with, with memorizing or just pulling scripture out of the hat, but to understand the context surrounding it. And my point in telling you truth and telling you the story and internalizing scripture is that that the word that we're, we're internalizing, the word that we're meditating on is part of a greater story. Don't you know that? That when John in the beginning says, in the beginning, he's referencing something else in the beginning. He's telling you a great big story. And you guys have, have been writing um, some of your reflections and we've been posting them and I'm, I'm seeing some common themes in the things that you're, you're speaking and the things that you're writing and getting certain thumbs up or whatever you react to on social media. And the things that I, I see is, you're all understanding the, the humility of Christ. That what humility it took for the Son of God um, to, to come to this earth, to leave his, his, his place in, in all glory in heaven, to come to us. And, and we look at, at uh, Philippians and chapter 2, and, and the, chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, which there you go, right there, we're like done, you know. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, without the Holy Spirit, let your work in me be done. How can any way can our attitude be the same as that of Jesus? But then it begins to describe this attitude, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. The second thing that you were all pointing out and that I, I see as a, a common theme is that it is impossible to separate Christmas from Easter, right? It's impossible. That's why, that's why a lot of people only come to church on those two days because they can't separate one from the other. That's a little pastor joke. Um, that's funny stuff right there. <laughs> Christmas and Easter are forever linked. That Jesus didn't just come in a vacuum as a little baby and that we, we just sit around and understand that little baby Jesus was born along with Santa Claus, Christmas trees, and everything else. But we understand that Jesus came into this world and he came into this world with purpose, right? And the purpose was to, to go the distance, to understand what we ourselves go through on a regular basis, to be able to sympathize and empathize with us, and then to walk in obedience to the Father to the point of death, even death on the cross, and then to walk in resurrection. Christmas and Easter are linked together, and we see it in Philippians where he says, and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and he became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and he gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of the Father. The third thing that I heard a lot of times um, or heard throughout the reflections that I've, I've read that you all have posted is um, an understanding of the Father's deep love and the immeasurable value that he must have placed on humanity to send his own son. Those that are parents understand the love that, that you would have for your own child and the thought of, of allowing anything to happen to that child, the great links that any parent would go through to not let any harm come to their kid. You know, the, the, the human emotion to know that God the Father so loved not just you, not just me, but he loved the world. He loved the world. And when he says that he loved the world, it wasn't as though he, he loved all the systems of the world. He loved all the people of the world, past, present, and future. Can you even get your head around an eternal God who, who loved you before you even knew that you were ever going to exist or that your parents knew that you were ever going to exist, that before the foundations of the world that God is love and loved so much? And John three sixteen, let it never become like a cutesy little memory verse that we memorize or, or a, a reference that we hang up when football is being played or whatever, but let it come alive in us every day that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal or everlasting life. That's the love of God. It's the love that you're experiencing and you're seeing and you're observing as you meditate on his word. 
The fourth thing that I've seen and, and heard as I've read your reflections are God's understanding and his sympathy. When, when you read Hebrews chapter four, it says this, therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us, with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. And then it says this, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that you may receive mercy and find grace in your time of need. Jesus, full of truth and full of grace. Hang on tight, whatever it is that you're going through. He gets it, he understands. And I've heard that repeatedly in the things that, that you've, you've written. Um, this morning I wanna take us back and if you're looking for a title, the title and the theme and the picture that keeps running over and over in my mind are about bookends and bookends hold the books up, right? And the bookends that we understand as believers, as those who've, who really understand the gospel story is that we're held up by the bookends of hope. And um, a few weeks ago, I, I asked a good friend of mine who's come here to speak as well, Trent Shepard. He wrote a book about the humanity of Christ. It's a great book. And, uh, and I asked him if he would just give a little bit of a reflection um, on this. And so he just did his little cell phone thing. So I'm going to allow, I'm going to ask um, that, that video come up. And as you do, uh, as, it, as it does come up, um, I'm, I want you to, to begin to get yourself ready to see um, what was happening. There's more than one gospel. There's more than one account. There's one big story with great perspectives. And John's gospel is a little unique in the way that he provides perspectives. So um, I'm going to let Trent introduce um, that idea. When the gospel writers are trying to introduce you to just who this babe in Bethlehem is, they do it in really interesting ways. So for example, the gospel of Matthew, when he's introducing Jesus to you, he does it by taking you right to Jesus's family tree. And what he does is he traces the lineage of Jesus all the way back to Father Abraham and Mother Sarah, the, the father and mother of the Hebrew people. And he does that very intentionally because he wants you to know that the story he's telling you about Jesus is a Jewish story. And that's why he goes back to the mom and dad of the Hebrew people, uh, Abraham and Sarah. But the Gospel of Luke does things a little bit differently. Uh, so what Luke does is when he's tracing the lineage of Jesus back to introduce you to Jesus, what he does is he goes back beyond Abraham and Sarah all the way back to Adam and Eve, the mother and father of the human people as a whole. And Luke does this really intentionally because you see he's the only non-Jewish writer in the whole New Testament. And what he wants you to understand is that the story of Jesus he's telling you, um, it has implications for all of humanity, regardless of race or ethnicity. And that's important to Luke. It's a personal thing he's doing because he's not Jewish. But the Gospel of John, and many years after Matthew and Mark and Luke have been written, when John decides to tell his own personal memories of Jesus, he does it in a different way altogether. He doesn't just trace it back to Abraham and Sarah or back to Adam and Eve. John begins his gospel by quoting the first few words of the book of Genesis. In the beginning. And what John wants you to understand is that the story of Jesus is not only a Jewish story. It's not only a human story. No, John is saying, this is the God story. In the beginning. Now, I can't express to you what sort of boldness it required of John to begin his gospel in that way. But incredibly, John doesn't stop there. He goes on to say that this Jesus, whom John calls the Word, who was there in the beginning, this Word became flesh. This God became human. This person lived and breathed and laughed and wept among us. Or as one Bible translator and pastor puts it, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Now that is very, very good news. So may King Jesus, that babe born in Bethlehem who was there in the beginning, who lives and laughs, breathes and weeps like you and me. May King Jesus make his home in your heart, in your church, 
in your neighborhoods this Advent season. Amen. Amen. Over to you, Pastor Danny. <laughs> Amen. I like that. I like the way that he shared that. And um, I like that he, he brought us back and helped us understand that this is the part of God's story, this in the beginning story. And we had to think about how stories work and how the Gospels work. And the Gospels are called historical narratives, right? They're historical because they're true. They're, they're historical accounts. They're um, something that really happened. They're a narrative because they're a, a story. They're an eyewitness, that these are accounts that people saw and they were validated accounts. And so what I get a picture of is the gospel story is a story within a bigger story, right? The bigger story is the big story of the Bible. The big story, um, or it would be called like a meta-narrative and a narrative. These two things that are together as one, and you can't separate one from the other. That in the beginning, that that's where it all began in creation. And in the beginning, um, as we read in John's gospel, we have hope of this new creation, this new um, to be born again. And one of the, the, the things I've been wrestling with and thinking in my mind is how much we attach and wrap around the gospel and how difficult we make it to understand. When John was presenting it, he gave this one big thing that you had to do. You had to believe it. You had to believe it. You had to believe it, and then you began to follow, right? And, and I think that if we're honest with ourselves, um, we are so hard on ourselves, we're so insecure, and we don't want to get it wrong, we don't want to mess it up, and we begin to complicate things. And those of us that do that, when we're living that way, when it comes to the gospel and when it comes to following Christ, we just start to do that to other people because that's what comes natural because you can only give away what you got. But for those, and oftentimes you find it in the young believer and the new believer and the one that is just so excited about the simple truths of the gospel that they have come so alive that you're like, what, are they allowed to do that? Are, are they allowed to dress that way? Were they allowed to say it that way? Because of this understanding of not a lot of things attached to it, but this, this ongoing story of through the love of God, you begin to follow God and God by his grace and through the power of his word and through your willingness to say yes to him, by the work of the Holy Spirit begins to change and transform your life so that you start to look like Jesus. But we're, we're those that we just want to fast track, man. Let's get it done, right? I'll read 27 books to make that happen. I'll get a group of people around me that'll beat me up and tell me how to make it happen faster and hold me accountable and make sure that it's happening. We kind of complicate the thing when there's a story that God is unfolding in our lives that if we're willing to accept Jesus, to begin to, begin to walk with him, begin to follow him, he is is doing something, and he was doing something even before you said yes to him. Am I making any sense this morning? I, uh, I told you this topic it was about these bookends of hope, and, and sometimes I think that we start our story with depravity. We start our story with everything's terrible, and, and really where we have to start our story in Christ is that everything is beautiful. That really, that in the moment of salvation, that's why it's called being born again. That's where your story starts. Have you ever been around a newborn? There's a couple here. I, I, I've had the privilege of being around new life and, and seeing life come into the world. That, 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 there's such beauty around that, that this something is beautiful. It's brand new. And there's so much hope. There's hope for the life of that child and, and whatever God will bring. And that's where your story starts in Jesus. I'm not taking away the reality of the fall of man. I'm not taking away the reality of sin and being born into sin. I'm not, I'm not rewriting biblical history. I'm telling you about your story. That your story in Christ begins with hope. The hope of the world. Jesus in you. The light of the world. And not only does it begin in hope, but it ends in hope. And you know that. That if you look at bookends... Beginning in hope, right? I am born again and, and ending in hope that there comes a great day when Jesus will return and fix all the wrongs and that, that he will bring justice to the earth, that he will judge the living and the dead and that we'll spend an eternity with him forever. That's two pretty straight up solid, simple understandings of hope. And guess what's in the middle of all that? A really messed up bookcase. I, I have some pictures here. Um, I, I started thinking about this, this metaphor of bookcases and, and, um, and what book, bookends actually do, right? Bookends hold up the books. And uh, this first, first one is um, a, a picture of a, of a bookend. This is not my house, uh, just before you, you start judging. This is just right off a of Google messy bookcase Google search. And uh, that just made me go, ah. 
right? There's really no structure to it. There's nowhere for those books to go. There's just a bunch of books, and life goes on, and you get a new one, and you read it, or you read a little bit of it, and someone comes over, and it's sitting on the coffee table, and so, or, or you just want to get it, it off the coffee table so you can put your food on it, and so you throw it in the bookcase, right? And you do that again and again, and you tell yourself, one day, I'm going to clean that thing up. And there's dust and things growing in it and whatever else. And it's just like you, you get sort of used to it and you tell yourself, I'm just not a clean person. So you're just into your, your bookcase that way. And yet you want your bookcase to be different, but there really isn't a whole lot of hope for that bookcase. Would you agree with me? Yeah. This next picture represents what happens when we understand hope, the hope of the world. Ah, it's like Pinterest all day long. I mean, it is so cool. It's just like, it's the right colors. <laughs> it's not just books stacked up straight, but there's some books going this way, but even the books are the right shape, and you can see everything, and it's just good. You know, I want my house to look like that. You, you can take the, the picture down. Um, the analogy is this, and, and what came to me, and, and you could take it or leave it this morning. I'm going to give it to you anyways. But, but I feel like what God is saying about hope and our understanding of hope and our understanding of our lives is that we've got to welcome his hope into our life. We've got to welcome the reality of what new beginning means to us. That it is, yes, it is that you don't have to spend eternity in hell, but it is hope for this entire life that you're on the planet. And it's for life that's going to be good, but not easy. And, and you see, when I look at, at those two different bookcases, when I look at the messy one, I cannot access that information, right? If, if, if you were to come over and you were to say, hey, you got that really good how-to book on how to build a birdhouse? I'm like, yeah, I know it's here somewhere. It's right, you know, and you're thumbing through it and you're trying to find that particular book, but you can't access the information. But you go over to the pretty Pinterest one and you're like, okay, I've got it all organized just right here. All my how-to stuff is you can pull it off and give that information away. What does that mean? What it means is that our life is made up of a big story and a lot of little stories along the way. Would you agree with me? A lot of those little stories, there's some, there's some stories that are like sweet. I love that story. I want to camp out in that story. And the reason, that, the way that you'll know about how you love that story is you ask somebody to tell you, hey, what's the story that I always repeat? And they will tell you. Because there's a story that we always repeat, a season in our life, a period of time where we're like, yes, that was awesome. When we won the playoffs in football or when whatever happened, when I had that awesome job that I loved or whatever it was that we like to tell that story. That book sits up straight and protected right? That book is held out aside from all the other ones. But then there's all this other stuff that happens. Tragedy that struck, and difficulty that happened, and, and sickness that came, and, and, and seasons of busyness where you have to like reintroduce yourself to your spouse, like, oh, hey, my name is, and all this kinds of stuff. And those stories are, just, I mean, they're just getting thrown into the bookcase. And what happens with hope? When hope comes into that big mess, which is this world of all kinds of different stories, when hope comes into that, we begin to see our lives through the lenses of hope. Those books begin to get propped up and they, they begin to become more understood. It's like, oh, that's why that happened. And each one of those opportunities where those books that are laying down flat and crooked and twisted and, and have little spots of grease and jelly all over them or whatever, they're, they're put back up straight. And now you have access to those books and you're able to see them through the lenses of redemption that, that there's something God is doing in and through every single story of our life. It's for you, but it's also for others. And you see, if you don't allow the bookends of hope, if we don't allow the bookends of hope into our life, all we're left with is a messy bookcase that we want to look pretty. But when you allow the bookends of hope into your life, when you allow Jesus to, to come in with new creation and bring and just breathe life into the stories of your life, then they pop back up and you're able to see them. Now you understand them a little bit better and you're able to help other people understand them. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you some examples of what I'm getting at. Um, I shared this with you before, but during the hurricane season, myself and another pastor from the city of Orange went to um, the city of Orange in Texas. And when we went there, we went simply to encourage the churches to, I went representing our police department to encourage their police officers, and he went um, as a fire chaplain to, to encourage the fire chaplains. And we just spent time interacting with different ones and hearing their stories. And I want to tell you um, the way that those bookcases looked, right? That, that there were those that had lost everything more than once. And when they told their stories, um, there were some who told their stories who, who were able to, to weep and, and to t say how difficult that it was and whatever else, but they would say this as if they had all talked before. They would say, 
but we don't quite know why. We have such a peace about us in this whole situation. We know everything's going to be okay, and all we want to do is help other people. Now, now can, I, can I give it away as those who were saying that? It was all the Christians. It was all the people who had invited the light of the world into their life to shine brightly. It was those who, who looked at that particular tilted tragedy and go, yeah, it stinks big time. Like, I don't know what we're going to do, but all I know is that we're going to be okay, and I know it's going to be okay. I mean, as if it were scripted over and over and over again. I got to tell you that it was not the same situation and not the same story for those that were telling us about the same loss without the perspective of the bookends of hope. For them, there was a lot of blame. They were mad at the government for the hurricane. You know, I thought you would laugh at that, but they really were. They, they, They were mad at the weather patterns. They were upset and rightfully so. Hey, I get it. You know, we just listened to their story and we tried to, to encourage them. But these were, these were these two different things. And, and we got to just begin to look at our own lives and how we see um, the things that happen in the various times and the, the things, the stories, how they sit on the bookshelf of our life. The apostles help us and give us kind of an example of this when they're talking to the early believers. And in Corinthians, um, they, they, they're, they're basically saying, hey, we're going through it, but it's all for you and we're good with it. And this is how they word it in, in 2 Corinthians in chapter 4 and verse 8. It says, we're hard pressed on every side. Who feels hard pressed on every side? Man, everywhere I look, someone's pushing on me. We're hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not struck down. We're abandoned, excuse me. We're, we're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. That was their perspective. And my prayer is that that will be your perspective. My prayer is that it will be my perspective. As, as I really internalize scriptures, I really understand um, what it means that hope came into the world through Jesus. Um, the creation account begins with hope. That, that God basically comes into a, a, a world that is formless and empty and dark and just void. And there really is no light. Light doesn't exist. And so what does God do? In his goodness, he's like, let there be light. He creates light. He's, uh, he then creates the wonders that we see and experience. And then he creates us in his own image. He creates us to be creative. Um, the second thing that I see in terms of hope that I want to leave with you is, so we, we have this creation account beginning with hope. We have hope for family. We have hope for family. I, I've said this so many times, but in my experience as a pastor, one of the most tragic things I see in, in people is loneliness. is a sense of disconnection. Now, we're a pretty individualistic society. We like to say, that, hey, we're fine on our own. We're good on our own. But really, that's not true, and we know that. That's why people spend so much money on Ancestry.com. Listen, I'm not mocking it. I, I think it's cool. I think it's really cool. But it's an illustration to say we care. We care about where we come from. We care about who we're connected to. We care about the fact that we're 63% Irish or, 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 or 22% this or that. Um, you know, we care about those things because why? Because we're, we're born with this, this desire to be connected and, and to be a part of a family. And when we don't feel that family connection, we want to search it out and discover it. Am, am I talking crazy or am I talking truth? And, and, and so no matter how, how much we might think that we're cool, we're okay by ourselves, we want to be connected. And, um, I was, I'm reading this book. Uh, another friend of mine wrote a book, um, and he's spoken here before, Jay uh, Lucas, and um, he's a, a Maori, who's first, first culture of New Zealand, the indigenous people. And he, in one of the chapters of his book, there's a Maori word called wapakaka. <laughs> and it says, it's, you say it just like that. He would probably smack me in the face for even saying it just now because I said it so wrong. But, but what it is, is it's, it's the introduction that a Maori would, would give to another person. They wouldn't say, hey, my name is Jay. He would say, he would begin to, to say who his great-great-great-grandfather was and where his great-great-great-grandfather lived and when, his, when that person married the other person and where they were connected and what land they lived in. And it would go all the way through and, in, and he'd say, and in the end, my blood is their blood, my land is their land, and my name is Jay. That's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. And for, for us, um, in, in a, maybe in a Western context, some of you may understand that better than I would. Um, I think it's cool, and I'd love to start some tradition where I do that, but it would just come out all wrong when I did it. I would, it would come out similar to me trying to quote John um, 1, 1 and 4, through 14. 
But, but it illustrates this point is that why I think it's so cool is because I think it's so right that we're connected and we're attached. And so instead of looking and going to try to find our connection and attachment to some other thing, we have it in Christ that it's built in. We are connected. Did you catch that part in, in, in John 1 where it says that his own didn't receive him, but then the, the yet, yet to all who jumped through every single hoop and were really good boys and girls, he gave the right to become children of God. He said, yet to those who believed in his name, his name, the same name that, that Joe sang about, that, that just serves notice on the enemy. To those who believe, he gave the right to become children of God. You are connected in this great big genealogy that dates way back to the beginning of the world, to in the beginning. The person who is the in the beginning speaker is your dad, your heavenly father. I don't know why you're not so excited. You're not just going, woohoo. You're not just like tearing your ties off that you're not wearing and just going, woo. This is truth. This is truth. And this truth for some of us that maybe have sat in the pew for a little while becomes real normal, you know? It's not normal. This is a miracle story. This is the good news. Lonely people don't have to be lonely at the core. They're connected to a family that you're a part of, that you have a genealogy that you get to introduce and go, hey, check it out. This is where I come from. This is my dad. It's an awesome thing. So far off my notes, I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. Um, John 1, 1, um, John 1, 11, it says, And he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent or human decision, but, uh, or a husband's decision, um, but born of God. I love this verse, and I'm not quite sure where this psalm all fits in, aside from saying that the psalms really help us understand the character and the nature of that father that we're so connected to. And, and this Psalm 37, 23 came to me as I was praying and thinking about today. And when you're thinking about the bookends of hope, think about your God, who's your father. It says, if the Lord delights in a man's way, he makes his steps firm. And though he stumble, though the book gets thrown in the case kind of crooked and that season's hard to understand, he will not fall. The Lord upholds him with his hand. I love this. Listen to the certainty of this. I was young and now I'm old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor their children begging for bread. They, were always, they are always generous and lend freely and their children will be blessed. It's awesome. It's awesome. And so just to, to end this thing and to recap it for you. There's hope. There's hope. Um, you are not formless and void, that you are worth living for and you are worth dying for. That's a key element of the gospel story. That you're welcomed into the ultimate family through your belief. I started thinking of um, how I wanted to end this. And, and if you walk through these doors here, um, you'll see we posted it up on the wall that it's it's there, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says this verse, it says, no, no longer will we regard anyone from a worldly point of, point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we'll do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. As you're um, thinking about your life and this morning, if there's anything to apply, um, it isn't a lot of things that you can necessarily do. It's just one decision that each one of us can make, and that's a decision to, to say, okay, God, Holy Spirit, let your work in me be done. And doing that from a place of understanding of he's good, he's my father, and there's a lot of hope in what he's up to. And though I might not understand the, the state of my current bookcase, his word tells me that he's making something beautiful out of the things that are going on in my life. And that if I will be in Christ, that, that there's new creation that's happening. And that to be able to see the pain of our life, to be able to see the difficulty of our life through the lenses of hope, it isn't rewriting history. It's seeing it the way that it was intended to be seen. 
We have a tendency to rewrite history based on our feeling and emotion. And so when we can surrender our feeling and emotion to a perfect heavenly father, it begins to make some sense. And so um, what I, the picture that I had of what God maybe wanted to do in our lives this morning and, and how maybe God wanted to come into, if your life was that bookcase, that he might want to come and, and go over to your shelf and go, hey, this book right here, this, this one, this one's not even necessary. It's gone. That book might be called fear and anxiety. It might be called religiosity. It, may, it might be called judgment. It, 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 there's, a lots of, there's lots of things. But there is stuff in your bookcase that doesn't even belong there. And guess who put it there? Me? No. <laughs> I didn't mean me. We did. Maybe I did. I'm sorry. I feel like I had to say that often. It's a hard job. Probably did, actually. I'm sorry again. But there's stuff there. There's stuff there that we put there that we allowed there that doesn't belong there. Just pull, it's, it's gone. And I, and I think that the Holy Spirit just wants to come along and just go, hey, that thing, it's just cluttering the bookshelf. It's that book that, that you have that, that it just doesn't belong. It's okay that it's gone. It's okay. Hey, you can even throw it in the trash and get rid of it. Nobody is going to judge you for getting rid of it. It's just gone. That book is gone. I say that because when you're trying to get rid of books, you always feel so guilty. It's like, what do I do with it? It's a book, you know? Can I throw it in the trash? Is that even legal? Um, but there's stuff God just wants off your bookshelf. Um, I, I, I sense the Holy Spirit going, okay, this one here that's on your bookshelf, this one also gets to go because I don't even know what this is anymore. You're the one who keeps remembering it. But, but when, I, when I was going through your books, the Lord says, he goes, I see this one that, that, that I, I didn't even know about because I forgave you. And when I forgave you, I, I, I got rid of that. It was as far as the east is from the west. I don't even remember because I've chosen to make my character as such that I can do that. So the only one that knows about that book is you. What a bummer that it's on your shelf. That one can go. The next one I, 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 I felt God was saying is, um, this one was so fun and exciting. This one was so good. I think you should think about this one a little bit more. I think this book on your bookshelf should have a little more prominent one. I think this is pure and praiseworthy and true. I think you should think about this one, this season in my life, to recall my faithfulness in this area. This is all me in that particular area. The last one I, I saw was, this one, this one goes right here. Um, this, this one, it hurts you deeply, but you don't have to hide it. You can, you can put this one right here. And, and this one, that, this is the one that, that, that we're working on together. You got that book on your bookshelf that you, you love it and you hate it. You know, I mean, a real book now. It's like, that's, that's my relationship with a few authors. And, and it's like, they speak such truth to you. And it's so right that you read it, but it's so difficult and painful to hear some of the things that are said through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But some of the, the, the situations of our life, we hide them away. We tuck them away. We throw them into the messy bookcase to just be forgotten. But the Holy Spirit's like, this one right here, put it right here, put it straight up, put it right next to that bookend of hope because I'm in that book with you right now. We're in this. I'm doing something beautiful through it. Don't run from that. I'm teaching you through it. And so through the bookends of, of hope, um, I, I believe that God wants to, to hold our, our life together. You know, he wants to, to make something beautiful in this big story and allow his grace to, to remind you this morning that he's making beautiful things. He's making beautiful things. They don't always feel beautiful as they're happening. But John 1.14 reminds us that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and that we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who comes from the Father. And this is how he comes from the Father, full of grace and truth. Would you stand with me as I, I pray for you as we, we end today? Lord, I, I want to just declare your goodness, that you're the God of the Bible, that you're the God of the Psalms that speaks of your faithfulness to all generations and the care that you have for us when we, we put our trust in you and our belief in you and our hope in you. God, this morning, I, I pray just to, if anything, God, if anything, that you'd inject us with grace and truth, Lord. Grace and truth. That you allow that truth to be spoken over all the extra stuff that we have added through the years and made a cluttered bookshelf. God, I pray for those that this morning, maybe some things kind of hit them and 
maybe on that bookshelf, it's to, to let go of some stuff that they don't even really want in their life, but for some reason it feels weird to throw away a book. God, help them to just have the freedom to get rid of it. Lord, for others who have remembered things that you have chosen to forget, God, give us freedom over that. That as we've confessed our sin before you, you have faithfully and, and justfully forgiven us and cleansed us of that unrighteousness. That your psalm tells us as far as the east is from the west, that's how far you remove that transgression from us to be remembered no more. Help us to just get rid of that one. Remove some clutter. Lord, help us, God, for those that this morning need to camp out in a season of their life or a moment in time where you proved yourself faithful and it was fun and it was exciting and it was wonderful because it reminds us those seasons of joy and celebration remind us of who you are and your character. But that's not the only place that we live, God, for those that, that maybe it's just really rough to bring out that one book of heartache and pain and difficulty. And certainly around the holidays, gosh, I don't know why, but it seems like all that stuff gets stirred up. And as that's stirred up, help us to face that particular book with some confidence, knowing that you're gracious and compassionate, knowing, God, that you will faithfully work through that difficulty and that pain in our life. And so we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to complete the work that you've begun, that you, God, became flesh, that you, God, have made your dwelling among us, that we have seen your glory, the glory of the one and only, full of grace and truth. And that's how you've come and you've been sent from the Father. Lord, we bless your name. We love you and we honor you. Bless your people now, I pray, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, amen. Before you leave, I don't know, you probably didn't like the sermon because it was like a half clap, but that's okay. Um, it, it's okay, I'm just kidding. I wasn't fishing, I just was acknowledging. Um, if, if you need prayer, listen, this is what this area is for. We are here pray to, to stand with you, to encourage you, to pray with you. Please come. We'd love to pray with you. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you next Sunday on, Mary, on uh, Christmas Eve. God bless you.